For part four, we're back with another short video, much shorter than video two, which I promised you was going to be short, which it was in slides, but not in time. This one's short and sweet, both in number of slides and time, centers around collision theory 12.5. And one of the things I don't love about the textbook is I feel like it would be better served to put collision theory earlier on. So you'll see a note recommending that you could even review this material prior to the rest of the chapter and it might help some of that material make sense and so hopefully if you've got any outstanding questions from what we've seen so far collision theory will help clear them up because there are three postulates of collision theory that can kind of explain all the observations we see with kinetics and you should know all three of the postulates of kinetic theory okay. number one is that the rate of a reaction is proportional to the rate of the reactant collisions and that's the key thing to underline right there reactant collisions it has nothing to do with the products okay we're thinking about reacting reactants and specifically how they collide together right that's what collision theory is all about okay. so to rewrite that a different way reaction rate hopefully you've seen this symbol before right it's proportional to reaction rate is proportional to the number of collisions per unit time. So the more collisions that are occurring, the faster the rate, okay? Or the fewer the collisions, the slower the rate. Okay? That's postulate number one. Postulate number two tells us that not only must reactants collide together, but the things that are reacting have to collide in a specific orientation that allows contact between the atoms that are going to form a bond, okay? It's another way to think about this is that these reactions have to happen in a specific orientation, right? The things have to come together. If you're gonna clap your hands, you're going to hit your palms together, right? Not the backs of your hands or not your fingertips uh, if you're trying to make a round of applause. That's the same thing for a reaction. Okay? It has to specifically allow contact between the atoms that are going to form a bond. So the way that they're oriented is important. And uh, the collision has to occur. I mean, postulate one tells us the collision has to occur in the first place. Postulate two tells us it has to have the right orientation. Postulate three here is telling us that not only must those first two things happen, but the collision has to happen with enough energy to allow the reaction to occur. And that reaction occurs between valence shells okay, in order to break bonds and form new bonds. Okay. So it has to have sufficient energy is what postulate three is telling us. And to illustrate that, we can look at a reaction between carbon monoxide and oxygen. Okay. Look at this right here. Okay. Well, why won't this reaction happen? Well, even if it has enough energy, okay, which is illustrated by that yellow flash in the background, that's the energy, right? No reaction's gonna happen there. If I'm trying to react carbon monoxide CO and oxygen O2 together to form CO2, well, that orientation won't work, right? Because I'm not trying to form an oxygen-oxygen bond, I'm trying to form an oxygen-carbon bond. So that doesn't happen. And so I have to flip that around and have the reaction occur in the first place. And so that's orientation is important. Collision, proper orientation, sufficient energy. Okay. Because again, even if they were oriented this way, if it was too slow of a collision, it didn't have enough energy, reaction could not happen. Okay. So even if you have proper orientation, the reaction's not guaranteed. You've got to have enough energy to reach what's known as a transition state or an activated complex, which is, which is an important idea, transition state. It's where we have bonds that are partially broken and partially formed. So look at a couple of examples of transition states here for that same reaction trying to form CO2. Well, if I'm trying to take carbon monoxide, CO, and oxygen, O2 together to form CO2, I need to form the new CO bond, and I also need to break the previous oxygen bond between the two oxygens. And so looking at three possible transition states here, this one on the top shows a carbon oxygen bond forming, that's what those dots represent, but I didn't break 
the old oxygen bond. So that doesn't work, even though it had the right orientation. Number two here is showing a carbon oxygen bond forming. And now I'm breaking the wrong bond. That's not going to get me CO2, okay, even though it had the right orientation. So only this last transition state works, okay, where I'm forming the carbon oxygen bond and breaking the oxygen oxygen bond. Okay. So again, we need a collision. We need to have the proper orientation and sufficient energy for these things to happen. Okay. And that's all summarized very briefly in this slide 57 here. Higher concentration means more molecules, which means more collisions, which means a faster rate, because it's just a game of probability, right? We need them to collide. We need them to have the right orientation and they have to have sufficient energy. So the higher the concentration in the first place, the greater the probability that happens. And then heating up a reaction will encourage it as well. So we finish this video with an idea of activation energy. If a reaction needs a certain amount of energy for that collision to be effective, right, and actually have the reaction go forward, there must be a minimum threshold, right, for it to happen. And there is, it's called the activation energy, okay, represented by this symbol, capital E subscript A, activation energy, the minimum energy necessary for reactants to collide and form products. And we can relate that to the kinetic energy of molecules that are in a solution. Okay? A higher activation energy means it takes more energy for the reaction to occur. It means it's a slower reaction. To go back to the running example we used before, right, this is like running up a steeper hill. Okay? Uh, more specifically, a higher hill. Steeper, higher hill, slower running, slower reaction overall. And we can see it, what the activation energy is in a reaction coordinate diagram. If we think about a reaction having the reactants A and B forming the product C and D, okay, what would that look like with a reaction coordinate diagram? Okay. A and B are my reactants, C and D are my products. Again, potential energy versus time. The activation energy, it's what's represented hill here, that hill that we have to get over. It's the energy difference between the reactants here and the transition state here. Okay. So you should be able to look at a reaction coordinate diagram and identify what's present. Reactants, products, transition state at the top of the curve there. Okay. And then the activation energy is the difference in energy between the reactants and the transition state. We also have the energy difference between the reactants and the products here. We know from back in chapter five, right, this energy has gone down. That tells us it's an exothermic reaction, that delta H. That's old news. Activation energy is the new stuff. Okay. So for this reaction to occur, the sum of the kinetic energies of A and B, the reactants, when they collide together, must be higher than the activation energy so that they can overcome that barrier and form the products and the reaction can proceed. You can also relate activation energy to the rate constant itself, right? Every reaction has a specific activation energy and a specific rate constant. And that's done with this guy. It's known as the Arrhenius equation. Okay. Rate constant K is equal to a frequency factor, which is unique to each reaction, right? E, the mathematical function. And then right there, we've got activation energy, gas constant, and Kelvin temperature. Now, one thing I'll bring your attention to, we won't use this a ton in lecture. You'll have it a little bit on your homework to relate the two, but that R value is with the units of energy, right? So we're not using the one for pressure. This has the value of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay. But we can also see what this means, right? It backs up what we've already been talking about. If we have a larger activation energy here, keeping in mind that this exponent is negative, a larger activation energy means at the end of the day, you get a smaller rate constant. It's harder for that reaction to occur. Okay. So conceptually, what you should understand about activation energy right, is as you increase 
the activation energy, okay? less molecules, fewer molecules, excuse me, can overcome that energy barrier. As you increase the activation energy, it's harder to get over. Okay? But if you're keeping activation energy the same, okay? if you increase the temperature going from T1 to T2 here, there are more molecules that can overcome that barrier. That's why increasing the temperature helps reactions go faster. Yeah. So again, higher activation energy, fewer molecules can overcome it. That's why we raise the temperature. So understand conceptually what activation energy means, be able to identify it on a reaction coordinate diagram like this, and know the three postulates of collision theory. Those are the big takeaways from this video in part four.